son. Psalms 119, if you'll open your Bible there. Psalms 119. <laughs> well, I woke up feeling good. Let's see what happens from there on. <laughs> Psalms 119. Let's start together in verse 64. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Now watch this. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. I like that. Just hold on to that. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Some of you have read that passage before. You've seen it in your Bible. And for some of you, let's just be honest, that's the first time your eyes have ever laid on those, ver those words together. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. And you could literally just keep going. But for this morning, I want you to consider verse 71. I just want you to put there your eyes on it. And, and I want to give you a moment to let your eyes adjust to it. Uh, because that is one of the most powerful passages you will ever read. It truly is. As the writer of this psalm, which as it turns out is the longest psalm in the entirety of the Bible, is saying the same things over and over again. As you read Psalms 119, he's saying all of the same things. God is great. God is good. Teach me. Guide me. Lead me. Instruct me. Grow me. Help me to understand. And then in verse 71, he says something that has captivated the attention of Bible students and readers for centuries. And it has a way of speaking to you in a way that nothing else can. It has a way of speaking into your life at the darkest moments that you will ever experience. And it's one of the messages, unfortunately, that, that I think has gotten lost. This morning I want to try to pour this into your life as best as I can. I want to talk to you a little bit about affliction. And, and most specifically, if I can kind of frame it this way, <laughs> the blessings and the benefits of affliction. I want you to meditate on, on what he said. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. I lived a certain way. But he said, now I don't. It is good for me. Deep breath. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Let's pray for a word today. Father, thank you for bringing us through every experience of life to bring us here. God, that has prepared us to hear whatever it is that you might say, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and they said amen. amen. One of the things that I keep saying over and over again, and I've, I think I've said it so much, and I've said it <laughs> for so long, that it seems like I've forgotten how long I've been saying it, is that it just seems like that we are in a time right now when everyone that you know, everyone that you know is going through something. Um. And by way of qualifying that, when I say going through something, I'm, I'm not belittling anyone's experiences and I'm not belittling anything that you're going through right now, but at the same time, I want to make a point. I want you to understand something, that there are a lot of people going through a lot of things, but there are a lot of people that are going through things right now that if they told you, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, if they told you, all of the things that have been happening to them and, in fact, are happening to them or around them right now, you would really look at them and say, now, come on, are you for real? And they're going through things right now that they wouldn't even want to trade positions with you or anyone else. And, and, and when I qualify this, I'm saying I'm talking about this morning not just challenges but serious challenges, uh, experiences in, in life that change you. 
the kind of experiences that you have that they stop you right where you are. They, they alter who you are. They change you. They redefine you. And in, and in their own way, they turn you off in a new direction with a whole new outlook on something, whether it's good or bad. Does anybody understand what I'm trying to, trying to dig in on here? You have experiences in your life that change the very fabric of who you are and then send you off in a new direction with either a, a great, wonderful outlook, a brand new revelation on something, or they send you off in another direction darker and broker and more torn than you were before you had that. The, the kind of times that people have that bring things into their lives that nothing else could bring into their life and the, and the kind of times that rip things out of your life that will never come back again. They are gone forever. Life troubles, family troubles, health issues. And understand this, I'm, I'm, I'm making this a point that I'm going to overmake this so that I, no one will be able to minimize what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not, when I talk about afflictions, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm having a bad day. Right? Or, oh, that hurt my feelings. Or, I got held up by some traffic lights today. Man, the devil is fighting me, you know. Those kind of things are just silly. The kind of things that you say to your friends, man, I had some rough time today. Let's go get a drink and, and laugh about it and we'll forget about it tomorrow. no. I'm saying that all around us, there are people right now that are going through things that are pushing them to their limits, that are in some cases challenging their sanity. Sometimes, I don't know if anybody can relate to what I just said, but sometimes you can be in such a situation that you ask yourself, am I losing my mind in this moment? And, and, and going through things that are bringing them to places where they've never been before. And in this moment, they are asking questions that they have never asked themselves before, especially about their faith. And bringing them to a place that I especially like this, they're bringing them to a place um, where religion and cliches just don't cut it anymore. And I hope somebody understands what I'm saying when I say this, that there comes a time in your life and in the experiences of your life when the challenges become so bad that the last thing you want to hear somebody give you is a little cliche. The last thing that you want to have is somebody come in with some little cute saying and say, oh, I, 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 I got a good feeling about this. I think it's going to be all right. Or, hey, brother, I, if he brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. Or tough times never last, but, but tough people do. Sometimes, have you ever been in such a situation like that where that was the last thing that you wanted to hear somebody say? Being as sanctified as I know how to be, you wanted to reach up and slap the taste out of somebody's mouth. And to be in such a place where it's so bad and somebody come along and treat it like it, it's, not, it's not bad at all. And, and if you've ever been in a season like that, what you really wanted to do is look back at that person and say, well, if it ain't so bad, why don't we trade places for a couple of minutes? And let you wear some of this for a little while. Uh, I know I'm, I'm open to making the point, but just indulge me. I'm saying that all around us there are things, people going through things in their life right now, that they've even come to the place where they have begun to ask themselves if life is even worth living. I saw a couple of days ago one of the mothers of one of the children that was arrested for shooting a man here locally. She was arrested, his son was arrested and a juvenile, and when they were talking to her about her sons, I saw her with tears in her eyes say to the authorities, do with him whatever you have to do with him because he's not my son anymore. I lost him to the streets a few years ago. See, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. When I talk about affliction, I'm not talking about, ooh, I got hung up at some red lights. I'm talking about something bigger than that. And so if I can, let me just cut to the chase and just go somewhere with this this morning. Psalms 119. The purpose of this psalm is actually a reflection of one of the most powerful revelations in the Bible itself. The purpose of this particular psalm is to magnify the divine law and the purpose of God above everything else. Say that again. The purpose of this psalm, Psalm 119 is to magnify the divine law and the purpose of God above everything else. And that is not meant to be just a cute little line that you hear in a sermon but you don't listen to. 
The purpose of this psalm is to magnify the divine law and the purpose of God above everything else. His law and his purpose is above my pleasure. His law and his purpose is above my own comfort. His law and his purpose is above my own expectations even of what it is that he's going to do in or with my life. His law and his purpose is elevated above my own reputation. His law and his purpose is elevated above my own wants and my own desires. And that may not in this moment captivate you as it should, but it will. Because I'm telling you that that is so often where we miss it. We have the distinction of living at a time when the cultural mindset of this world is that the highest purpose of my life is for me to be happy. You know I'm telling you the truth. We live at a time when our culture is telling you that the highest purpose of your life is for you to be happy. And I don't minimize that, but we've now lived in that for so long that it has now become accepted as fact and, in fact, has begun to be preached as theology. <laughs> Hang with me here. That the highest purpose of life as a believer is for me to have a better life than everyone else does so that I can prove to them that God is real and that God is good. Did anybody follow what I just said? It has now become accepted as fact and preached as theology that I am supposed to, as a believer, live a life that is so much better than yours that the way I live it makes you say, oh, i gotta, I got to go to his church and i got to do whatever it is that he does. And we've now pressed that into a neatly compressed, marketable package that we call this prosperity doctrine so that converts today... When they finally do come to a church and when they finally do come to an altar and kneel down to pray and ask Jesus to change their life, when they get up, they get up believing that the sole purpose for that moment is so that they can have a better life. Well, that's right. He can make my life better. I drove in in a Toyota, but I'm driving out in a Lexus. That's so accepted. I, this, I don't know if I'm preaching to the wrong crowd. So accepted it has become that we now say it without even considering its implications in our evangelism. Amen. Hang with me here. When, when, we're trying to, when we're trying to get lost souls to convert and come to Christianity, one of the things that has become standard in our vocabulary is this little phrase, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And... We rarely, if ever, consider how ludicrous that is in the light of true biblical Christianity. <laughs> Woo! I'm preaching on affliction this morning. And while there is that element to it, the problem with that is that if we live life thinking that God's will is that I have an easy life, that not only have we missed something, but brothers and sisters, we've pretty much missed everything. We've pretty much missed the whole thing. And I'm about to mess with somebody's theology, and you can hate me now, but you'll love me later. The truth here is amazingly complex. Yes, it is God's will that I be blessed. Amen. It is God's will that I be happy. It is God's will that I prosper. I believe that. And yet, yes, in comparison to all of those who don't know him, no matter what your state in life, if you are a believer, you already are more prosperous than anybody else. Amen. Let me preach just for a minute to believers who have forgotten how blessed you really are. That at any moment of your life, as a believer, even on your worst day, your life is better than an unbeliever on their best day. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. <laughs> because, because, even on my worst day, when nothing's going right and it's all falling to pieces on my worst day, my name is still written in the Lamb's book of life. He is my God. He will take care of me. He'll never let me down. He is my healer and all of that. And yet, even though all of that is true, to live every day believing that I will never be touched by trouble is to live your life believing a lie and set yourself up for confusion when trouble comes to your life. 
See, just because I'm a child of God doesn't mean that I'll never be afflicted. Just because I'm a child of God does not mean that I will never deal with affliction and I'll never be down in my life. In fact, true discipleship tells you exactly the opposite. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yes, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. When's the last time you heard messages in the church on suffering persecution? John chapter 15, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Bring the hate on. Bring the haters out. Matthew chapter 5, he said, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Ain't nobody rejoicing. Matthew chapter 24, you shall be hated of all nations for my sake. And then you throw on top of there this revelation from a single line in Psalms 119. It is good for me. Help me preach. Somebody who loves you needs to tell you that your theology is not complete until you can nod your head when you read that verse. And you don't have to say nothing. You don't have to tell anyone. As a matter of fact, you can't even explain it for anyone. How that you read, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. And there are tears that come easily into your mind from a memory. Just a memory, a memory of something that you went through some time ago that you misinterpreted horribly at the time. I said you misinterpreted it horribly at the time. You thought in that moment that not only had God forsaken you, but that you deserved it. You thought, because you know how you live and you know what you think and you know the things that you've done and, and you started feeling and experiencing trouble in your life and you thought in that moment that the only way for you to learn what you were having to learn is for God to teach you a lesson. And so you fully believed that that trouble that came your way was the lesson that you had to get. Job's friends stand forever as a representation of how we can sometimes completely misinterpret everything when we see what's happening, but we don't know what's going on. Last Wednesday night, I preached on living by faith, and, and I said this, that everything in life is how you see whatever it is that you're looking at. And I didn't say it then, but I'm sure enough going to say it now. I'm saying that so many times in life, we can see what's happening but we don't know what's going on. We can see what is happening, but we don't know what's going on. What's happening is I lost my job. I, one day I had it all, and I had it there, and it was all good. What's happening is I lost my job, but what's going on is something even greater. I don't know if you can relate or understand what I'm saying, but God is just positioning you for something else. God is positioning you for a greater future, for another open door. You wouldn't quit the job that you said every day that you hated. And so now God just stepped in and removed you from that. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. What's happening is my marriage is in trouble. And it's not good. But what's going on is that God is working in you. In this moment, because honestly, you are child, selfish, and insecure. And the only way that you're ever going to grow up is when life walks up and slaps you in the face. It is good for me. Y'all ain't saying it. It's all right. I'll preach to myself. <laughs> What's happening is I'm going broke. You say every day it just seems like I'm, I'm, I've got less and less in my bank account. But what's going on is economics 101 heaven style. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. What is happening is you got caught. <laughs> whether it was Ashley Madison or the subway guy but what's going on is something greater and with all of that being said consider this open your Bible Psalms 119.71 as this psalm says something that seems to make no sense at all 
He says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. So quickly, the word affliction. The word affliction in that verse means to look down or to be looked down upon. Maybe somebody doesn't need any more than that because you've already been through enough life and experiences right now where you understand that and that you can't even find the strength or the hope to be able to lift up your head and look up and look people in the face anymore. All it feels like your everyday life is is that you're looking down. And it sounds strange for us to say it because all the time we've been told that we're supposed to be looking up. But never forget this, to everything there is a season. The word affliction, to be afflicted means to be depressed. He said, it is good for me that I have been depressed. To be afflicted means to be chastened. There is an old biblical almost forgotten word that means to be corrected. You are off track and this is the correction that God is bringing to bring you back to the place where you need to be. I was talking to to Pastor Trevor just last week and and just a few days ago and after we were talking um, about people that we know of right now that are going through things, sometime later he said, and and I, I wrote it down, he said it's in those times that you find out what you're really made of. Can somebody nod your head and say amen? It's in those times that you find out what you're really made of. In those times is when you find out what you're made of and what you really believe. Let me preach to somebody, anybody in here this morning who's in a time of affliction in your life and say this. It is then that you remember all of those things that have been deposited into your life. All of those times when you were sitting in church and you heard those sermons on tests and trials and tribulations and tears and all of those things, but they meant nothing to you at the time. When it reminds you of all of those times when you heard those testimonies of other people. The testimonies of other people who were being honest with you and telling you about the mess that they walked through. And while you were listening to them, you were thinking, that doesn't have anything at all to do with me. But then one day... It all turned off in another direction. And all of hell came your way. And now that story starts to be familiar. And you remembered that word that you yawned your way through. Amen. You remember that testimony that honestly you didn't listen to because that old lady cries about everything. Amen. But now... Her story sounds so familiar and now you're looking for her in church so that you can ask her a couple of questions and find out what God did and how he brought her through and maybe she will bless you by laying hands on you and praying that God will bring you through the same mess that she was in that you're in now. You see, in your time of trouble, you find out what you are made of and what you believe, but even greater than all of that, you find out how great your God really is. I'm telling you this morning, you don't know how great God is until you have been there. The purpose of this psalm is to magnify the divine law and purpose of God above everything else. God's law and his purpose is above your own desire for pleasure. His law and his purpose is above your own reputation. He raises these things that sometimes in your life, sometimes you need to understand this, that it's not, sometimes you need to understand this, that it's not always about you looking like a winner. Can we just drop that one now? Perfect people make me nervous. Perfect people who always, you know, everything, they're always walking on sunshine and everything's just fine. No, that's just not real. Uh, Perfect people make me nervous. And sometimes it's not about you always looking like a winner. Sometimes it's not about easy prayers getting answered. Sometimes it's all about hard times. And it's about trouble and it's about tears. Because you don't know until you know the lessons that affliction can teach you. And I'm telling you this morning, this is a word for everyone right now. This is either a direct word from God for you right now because that is what you are experiencing right now. Or it's an echo from your past because God is graciously reminding you of something that you are in danger of forgetting. Just say it. When God gets you out of a mess and you forget where you were and then you look at people in a mess and you're like, (laughs) or 
It's a preparatory word for your future because something is on its way. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn. The word good in that verse means it is good. It is a good thing. It is beautiful. It is better. It is best. It is pleasant. It is pleasing. And it is making me ready. So he said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. It is good for me that I have looked down and I have been looked down on. It is good for me that I have looked down and I have been looked down on so that when I come out of this moment, I will never again forget that he is my glory and the lifter of my head. Times and circumstances pushed my head down, but God brought me out of it. It is good for me that I have been looked down on so that I can know how that feels. It is good for me that I have been depressed. And all my depressed people right now, you're nodding your head. You're wondering, is I lost my mind? I have not lost my mind. It is good for me that I have been depressed because how can I know what it means to live with joy unspeakable until I have lived with pain that is inexpressible that I can't even tell you how bad it hurts. It is good for me that I have been depressed so that he can raise me out of it. Let's walk this out. It's good for me to lose so that I can treasure times when things are just coming my way. It is good for me to weep so that I can know how sweet it is to laugh again. It is good for me to experience betrayal so that I will know what a friend we have in Jesus. It is good for me. Good for me. You had, you had to live out your life showing everybody your true colors. And we know what your true colors is. No, you don't. You had to live out your life showing everybody your true colors for this one purpose so that you could show them what it looks like when red blood washes a black heart and turns it as white as snow. God, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Hallelujah! In my own sermon. Woo! Our struggle in this age is to overcome the myths that we have lived with for so long, we now accept them. That bad things happen to bad people because they're bad. <laughs> and good things happen to good people because they're good. If you believe that, you have lost your mind. We, ladies, Come rescue me from this. Late, we have got to get back to believing. I know what y'all are thinking right now. Y'all are thinking, preach some more. Nope. <laughs> nope. nope. I'm going to leave you wanting a little bit more. We have got to get back to believing that God is good no matter what. Amen. We've got to get back to believing that God is God no matter what. We have got to get back to believing that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All of it. Your, your face was in the paper. Okay. It's all right. At some point, you'll look back on it and know what he brought you through. We have got to get back to believing that he makes all things beautiful in his time. You know why? You know why I don't throw stones at anybody? Because I'm a dog myself. What are you clapping for? <laughs> Mauricio, yeah. Yes, he is. Preach, son. You don't even know. You don't even know. <sighs> Ask Kathy. She don't even know. I, I, I just hear it as if your life depended on it because it does. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. It's made me what I am. It's made me who I am. 
Your pain has a purpose. There is a purpose to it. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. And yeah, you, you, you did all the wrong things and you agreed with it and you stepped into it. And it's all over your shoes right now. And everybody sitting around, you can smell it. <laughs> if you're from Palatka, you know what I mean. But it's all right. Because he'll turn it around and he'll, he'll just... Your story had to include this. Your story had to include this. Otherwise, you'd be just another pampered, spoiled, childish, rich kid. Amen. And that's all I see on TBN today. Amen. Pampered, spoiled, childish, rich kids. Oh, I'm a child of the king. Have you forgotten what the streets look like, son? Maybe this can help. God, I got to stop. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Paul said this light affliction, which is but for a moment, does work within us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Translation, it's worth it. You can make it. You can take it. You can handle it. You can walk it out. And at some point, it will become the tool in your hand so that you will know what to do with that in your future. Let me talk to everybody in here this morning who is in affliction. If you will, bow your heads and open your hearts with me. I don't think, I, I don't know, I could be wrong. But I don't know that I've ever seen a time when, when more of my people, more of the people that are around me are going through more things. And again, not just little bad days, I'm talking about Affliction. And it just stirs my heart when I read a passage like this that tells me it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I know. Our heart today is for the people in the house who are walking through things that you don't understand. Maybe it's a season of affliction right now that you just don't completely understand what it is. You're looking down. Or you're being looked down on. You're dealing with stress, pressure, depression. You feel like you're being chastened for something. And maybe you can't explain it. You don't understand what that is. This morning... I believe that this is an orchestrated moment. And I don't know how many people can really understand that. This is an orchestrated moment. It is good for me that I have looked down and been looked down upon. <laughs> so that I will know that He is my glory and the lifter of my head. It is good for me that I have been depressed so that I will one day know again that the joy of the Lord is my strength. It is good for me that I have lost and I've experienced loss and I've had betrayal so that I will know he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I'm trying to help somebody see here this morning. It is worth it. It is good. You abandon yourself to God. You put yourself in His hand. You trust Him. And He will give you beauty for ashes. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. And at some point in your future, you will understand it better by and by. At some point in your future, it will become the tool in your hand that you will use. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. You will use it in your future to bring others out through the same route. This morning, heads are bowed, hearts are open. Father, I pray for your people. That's all I can do. You brought us this far. The rest is yours. Father, speak, help, heal, deliver, confront, challenge. Do your work, your way. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name. I'm not standing up here this morning telling you that give your life to God and he will give you a better life. In the end, we know that's true, but I'm telling you, give your life to God. And he will give you eternal life. He will give you eternal life. 
give your life to God? Yes, he does have an amazing plan for your life. But for John the Baptist, that plan included beheading. For Jesus, that plan included crucifixion. Everything in life is how you see whatever it is that you're looking at this morning. I see tears. I see broken hearts. I see brave fronts. I see brave fronts and brave faces. Behind those brave fronts and brave faces, there are broken hearts. There's tears and fears in our struggles. I don't know how much longer I can be strong. I don't know how much longer I can wear this face. I don't know how much longer I can keep saying, I'm fine. And here I come walking up in here on a Sunday and you tell me, this is good. At the end of church, Pastor, I want to slap you. I wouldn't recommend that. I just say, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. 